All right, thank you for joining us at Oakland Creates. Uh, this afternoon, I'm interviewing our featured artist for Oakland Creates 2022, Robert Lou Trujillo. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, folks, and we're gonna jump right in to the interview. Uh, first up, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you a little bit more about Oakland Creates. Oakland Creates was um, started as a vision for me, basically to bring people together from different communities to share their art, to sort of help facilitate them in um, selling their art, but also intermingling with the community and each other as artists. So she, we could uh, share space together and feel comfortable, welcome, and really celebrate it as artists. Um, we prioritize women of color, artists of color that uh, maybe don't have uh, their voices represented in the mainstream art world. I really recommend you looking us up on Instagram and Facebook. Um, not so much Twitter anymore, but definitely um, Instagram and Facebook will give you all of the updates for Oakland Creates 2022. Um, and then I'm just talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I self publish a comic book uh, based in Oakland called Nothing Good Ever Happens at 4 a.m. It's a horror comic where zombies invade Oakland. I typically draw anything sci-fi, horror-based, scary, creepy, or weird. I uh, just recently started drawing per zines or personal zines about my mental health uh, and how to navigate spaces around um, anxiety and um, self-care, self-awareness uh, about uh, harm reduction, as well as making zines about um, my recent visits to the hospital with sleep apnea and other health issues. Um, you can find my work in various uh, books like the comics anthology Artist Against Police Brutality or um, the Black Comics Returns uh, anthology, and as well as the anthology Drawing Power. Um, but now I'm just going to jump right in and ask Robert to introduce himself before we get into interview questions. Thank you so much for having me, Avi. Uh, my name is Robert Luther Hill. I'm an artist uh, from the Bay Area, born and raised in Oakland. And I work in a lot of different fields. Uh, visual art is my main thing, but I work in public art, creating large scale murals with a collective called Trust to Struggle. I do kids books and have been in that field for uh, almost a decade now working mostly in picture books but middle grade and YA as well and I also uh, I guess kind of participate in other things like uh, the bullhorn blog which is like a, a, a kid lit blog at the intersection between kids books and social justice um, one of the organizers of the social justice children's book holiday fair which is a mouthful and um, yeah that's that's pretty much me um, I'm, I'm a dad I'm a husband that's that's it Thank you so much for introducing yourself. So um, I have a little bit of your artwork here. Um, just tell me a little bit before we get into questions, um, a little bit about Fairquan's first flat top, why you wrote it, uh, what's it about, that kind of thing. For sure. So uh, for Khan's first flat top is a book that I wrote and illustrated. I started the process of this story back in 2009, 2010. And what it was, was I wasn't getting much traction in the children's book world, which is notoriously uh, gatekeeped. And so I decided to kind of work on my craft by writing and illustrating short stories, which are basically a sentence or a paragraph and an image. And for Khan is one of those stories that people really responded to. So I decided to take it from one and to make it uh, basically like 15 spreads or, or 16 spreads. And I wanted it to be bilingual uh, because uh, I learned Spanish as my second language and my son was going to a bilingual school at the time. And nice. I wanted it to be about uh, an Afro-Latino kid. I'm a mixed kid, my son is. And I know a bunch of people who they haven't seen uh, that many books about themselves, especially um, it kind of astounded me that in the kids book world, there was no book about uh, someone going to get a flat top or just, there was some about going to the barbershop or getting your hair braided, but not going to get a flat top specifically, which was, uh, mind boggling to me. And so um, I didn't get traction kind of pitching into people. So I just decided to self publish it. And nice. I started off as an illustrator kind of had to uh, get my wings as a writer and I'm still working on that. Awesome. And I also see you make um, stickers and posters encouraging kids to read and to be proud of themselves that kind of thing. Can you yep. tell me a little bit more about the ones on the right here? 
Yeah, so I think this was um, actually before the pandemic, I was trying to just remind myself, or maybe it was during, maybe it was during the pandemic, I was basically just trying to remind myself to, um, to practice my artwork and to do uh, uh, a lot of type art or typography or hand lettering. Nice. And so doing these was, that was part of it, that that practice led to me doing these phrases like stretch and put your phone down. But I also wanted to make something that would be uh, just a reminder, like something to be like, contact your friends. Like you could be easily caught up in your work or life or if you have yes. a family or a partner. So it's important to like contact your friends, reach out to them, drink more water, just basically reminders to myself. And then I thought maybe I'll make a sticker sheet out of it. And then that one, it was really popular. So people like that. Very cool. Uh, I do reminders. A lot of my zines are, I'm talking to myself as well as to other people. So I can re uh, relate to that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have a, a mixed um, sort of array of stuff here, the yep. poster prints, um, as well as the bookmarks. What made you start doing bookmarks? Um, so I, I, as I said, I started in kids books and then I want, I saw a lot of bookmarks that were being handed out at the library or bookstores or sometimes events. And I didn't see any like uh, the ones I was thinking of, which was like a black boy or a black girl reading. Right. And, and I was like, well, I'm just gonna have to make one. Make and then when I did that, you know, parents and uh, teachers really responded to it. So I started to make more uh, a Latino boy and girl reading uh, and then just started to make more and more. And then some of the other things that you see on here, really, I would say revolve around my uh, interest or my passion as a, a visual artist. So um, there's the books that are there. There's a portrait. I do portraits of kids. There's a bunch of different postcards and other images which have a, a portrait or um, a bust of somebody. And yeah, there's some some art prints as well with some type of scenery or story happening. I really like that you represent yourself and other kids can resonate with that too that are either mixed or Latino or brown. Like you said, we often don't see ourselves uh, reading books or just chilling, doing yoga, meditating, that kind of thing. So it's nice to see um, us represented in that way. I really love the headphones too because I like to incorporate headphones in my art too. So that's that, that's dope. Yeah, and the headphones now are so much cooler than they were when we were in <laughs> school. I mean, when I was in school, it was like you had like one uh, color, one size. That was it. Now they come it. in all types of colors and yeah, lots of designs. Dope. So your new book, Art of Rob, is out now. Tell people where they can find it locally as well as online. Yeah, so if you're in the Bay Area, you can purchase it at Pegasus Books, Marcus Books, uh, Modern Mouse in Alameda, and nice. the Multicultural Children's Bookstore in Richmond, California. And I just got it into a store called Push and Pull in Seattle and then one called uh, Skylight Books in LA. But it is basically a, a book of art. Uh, it has sketches in it, it has character designs, it has uh, some hand lettering, some typography. It has pages from my actual sketchbook. And what it is is that um, I've been presenting to students, God, for almost 10 years where I would go in, I would show them a book, but I would also show them my sketchbook and show them some of the process art and they always really dug that, sometimes even more than the book. And so I was like, man, I really have to um, do my research. And in doing my research, I found, you know, there's a lot of comics artists that have sketchbooks, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. a lot of designers that have them, but not too many uh, kids book people. So I was like, let me make one and just see how it went. And so far, it's been really received well. That's fire. You actually encouraged me to make my book. So I want to give you much blessings and courage. Oh, that's uh, awesome. encouragement. Continue doing it. You definitely motivated me because I think like you've been thinking, I need to make an art book for years. And finally, I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to Seattle. I need to, you know, make something that encompasses everything that I've done, especially during lockdown. So you definitely inspired me, bro. So I definitely that's appreciate, awesome. appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank and you. So, I can't wait to get it. Nice. So I want to jump into the questions, a little bit of background about you. Where did you grow up? Yeah. So like I said, I was born in Oakland. I went to junior high and high school in, in Berkeley. Uh, and I've lived in Berkeley, Oakland, El Cerrito, Richmond, uh, Hayward. My grandparents on my mom's side and my, my mom and her brother and sisters all from Frisco. So they lived in the Bay nice. area. Um, so I've I've been all over the Bay and I lived in New York for a short stint as well. Born and bred. That's hella dope. Yeah. OK, so what's your earliest memory that you can think of making art? Like my older brothers made art. So I definitely have a, a memory of my own. When when do you remember like picking up a pen and, you know, 
specifically making art to you know just sit down and draw what's your earliest memory of doing that um I don't remember like a specific time I think I always just really liked to draw and then my mom saw that I was that I love to draw as well and she knew that I was very very inspired by graffiti um and was, I've, I've told this story many times but I saw you know Belle Bill DeVoe and their outfits and the airbrush and I was like yo mom gotta get that <laughs> and she took me to Hilltop uh, which is an old mall in the Bay Area in, in, yes. uh, in Richmond. And uh, I met yeah, the dude. airbrush shop in the corner, right? Yep, yep, sure. Oh, and, my God. And uh, Brother Dream, who's a Filipino real hood dude from East Oakland, he was there and he was uh, airbrushing shirts. And I think from that, it really graffiti was the doorway that kind of just expanded my mind and made me want to, you know, really get into it. And I love that. I love that because, yeah, I grew up in Richmond, so I know exactly where you're talking about. And Dream yep. is just a, you know, real one from day one. God bless him. Rest yep. in peace. Dream, Mike. Oh, my God. He was the best. I remember him even coming to talk at my college when I was in college at CCA back in the oh, 90s. Wow. Yeah, wow. he came and spoke about graffiti because I had a dope ass painting teacher that asked graffiti writers to come. And he was one of the artists dream and uh, other people from T, uh, TDK came up and and talked during his lecture hour. So oh, that's dope. man, that's hella dope. And they're uh, spray paint their uh airbrushing shop was notorious like everybody was wearing that stuff so that's awesome yeah um so did you have like some you said your mom encouraged you was there a teacher yeah. or anybody else that um encouraged you during your childhood to draw yeah so my mom was a big encouragement my dad encouraged me as well my family has always been super encouraging I would say the big encouragements that I got was from fellow writers like other people who were into the same thing and nice. then um, the first time I got to meet a professional artist, like somebody who did that as their job, was this uh, brother named John Chewy. Uh, everybody just called him Chewy, but he was a uh, working editorial illustrator. And he did stuff for magazines, for ad agencies. And this is back in the early 90s. So he had some of the first computers and like the first uh, Photoshop. And he, the majority of his work was done with airbrush and traditionally, but he did digital as well. And so just seeing his work and like the, his studio and the body of um, work that he did was just inspiring, really inspiring as a kid. Nice. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so folks can see our faces. Uh, so oh, can you see me? It looks like I'm gone. Yeah, it looked like you disappeared. I don't know if you want to. Uh, I'll fix my. I'll just read off uh, the questions on my phone. Okay. Um, and so. Like you said, your mom really encouraged you. So do you have a specific or other artist um, as now as an adult that inspires your work? Yeah. So um, there's a brother named uh, Gerard Huerta. I don't think he's related to uh, Dolores Huerta, but he's a, a type based artist and he does graphic design. He's done the, the lettering for so many different rock bands. And I love looking at his work. He's super talented. Um, there's these cats named Morning Breath. Um, it's a design agency. One is kind of uh, the the illustrator and one more does like the design and type, but they kind of do a little bit of both. And they're, one of them's from Jer from New York, from the East Coast, and one of them's from Frisco, who used to be a writer named Doug One. And they, they're they really inspiring, just seeing what they do with um, album art, with uh, advertisements, with packaging, and even with murals. Oh. Um, let me think. Uh, also, Mode 2, who's a who's a graph artist from uh, Paris, France, and he spent a lot of time in the UK as well. He's really an inspiring artist for me. There's so many of them. I think of Juan Alicia as well, who's a muralist. If I start going into illustrators, it'll be we'll be here for a while. But <laughs> OK, those are dope. Those are dope. Um, we'll try to I'll get that so we can put that in the description box below so people can check those out. Um, so do you feel like there's an overarching theme or message to your, your work? Yeah, I think, well, one of the things that I talk about, excuse me, a lot is ethnic studies. So and when I went to Berkeley High School in California, we were super fortunate. I didn't realize how fortunate I was as a kid, but there was uh, ethnic study classes there. So we got to take Black studies, Rasa studies, there was Asian American studies, and I went to San Francisco State as well, which was the one of the, I think, the first school, if not one of the first schools to have ethnic studies in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I think I had a, a much, I mean, you get a strong sense of yourself and your family and, and your, your homies and all that. 
But I think taking those classes and being able to speak to professors that look like myself or teachers that look like myself, it was just really empowering. So I think part of my mission when I make artwork is to try to do the same thing for young people, even if I'm not face to face or in the classroom with them to be able to make art that kind of talks about that. If they don't know anything about ethnic studies to at least um, hip them to it, to be like, what is that? Right. And to ask questions. Um, I think telling your own story is really important as well. Like if, if you're going to make artwork to kind of tell it from your perspective and to not let other people just kind of put you in a box or make a stereotype out of you. So right. I think those are two really big things for me that um, are themes in my work. That's awesome. I appreciate that. And so do you feel like um, there's a art style or art media? Um, so some type of technique that you haven't tried that you'd like to try in the future? Yeah, I would really love to do stop motion animation. Um, I've never animated too many things. Usually what I've done is on paper, uh, just 2D animation. Mm -hmm. But I would love to do stop motion animation, either as a director or an actual model maker or a background painter or an actual animator. But I, so, I love stop motion. Would you think you'd want to use clay or models or what kind of stop motion? I think motion? Um, probably not clay. I think of like... Uh, like some of the Leica films or um, like Shaun the Sheep or uh, the most recent film with uh, Jordan Peele and uh, Henry Selleck. I think that like actual, you know, maquettes, like they're, they're usually like that big, uh, okay. um, those and to be able to pose them and move them and to make them look, I mean, they're, they're stylized, but they're of humans mostly. Right. That sounds hella fly. Okay. So um, do you think that your, your daughter now influences the art that you make? I know you talked about your son influencing you making books, um, kids lit so that kids could read. Do you think your daughter now influences though your work? Oh yeah, most definitely. Because I think as a as a kid coming up, and even with my son, I would say the the majority of uh, shows that were coming out were all about boys, or it was very uh, male centric, or people mm. who are uh, male presenting. And right. I think there's been a flood and a, a beautiful array of uh, female centric animated uh, characters. So like. Dora the Explorer, I think, was one of the first to really get it cracking, and my son loved that show. <laughs> um, but now there's um, Molly of Denali. There's uh, so many different ones. Uh, I could think of Karma, which is Ludacris's show. And I think that has made me think about how can I make something that speaks to her and also to kind of be a part of that ecosystem and kind of helping those stories get told and more broadly right. and right. not just one type of thing like having a bunch of different uh stories that would speak to to her or kids like her right or is there anything that she's watching now that you're just like please choose something else <laughs> yeah sure sure i mean she likes watching uh cry babies and and that's kind of i think any cg show for the most part that's like overly uh, what's the word maybe like snarky or like too much snarkiness <laughs> for a four-year-old I'm just right. like mm. or or it's just like a little too polished and that kind of annoys right. me but if it has a little bit of style to it then you know I'll, I'll get it's down okay. with it oh, yeah that's awesome that's hilarious because normally parents are like baby just pick another book for me to read or can sure. we watch a different movie yeah yeah <laughs> I mean that's that's just how it is they they love to repeat you know what book film whatever that song play it again play it again let's watch it again yeah so I know that you take great care of your uh your daughter so is there a particular time where you can get time alone to create uh, my favorite time of day is obviously 4 a.m that's why I made the comic and kind of a <laughs> knock right. like inside joke on that what time of day do you find that it's more quiet and you can kind of slip away and and spend time creating stuff for yourself? Well, today, for example, we, we take turns, me and my wife take turns. So there's days when I watch her and she gets to do her thing. And there are times when she'll take her and watch her and I'll do mine. I would say the best time for me is probably the morning or early, early afternoon, because I'm no longer 19 and I can't stay up till, <laughs> till late painting. Cause I'll just, I the painting will look bad and I'll be tired. And then she, you know, kids, I've been waking up and being a morning person since my son was born. So that's 18 years now. So I can no longer really sleep in. So I would say the morning, early afternoon is the best time. Good, good. If she wakes up earlier, I'm assuming. Yeah, usually about 7 a.m. on the dot. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I was an early kid. I knew better than to wake my mom, but I would just right. be, we had a nice backyard and I would get out there like four or five. I've always been an early riser, but yeah, I really, uh, in a black mom's household, <laughs> don't wake your mom up. Right, don't, exactly. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't do but it. I, I would get up uh, early. So I, I feel you on that. And so for kids' books, what does that mean for you? Diverse books or um, different types of books for kids. What does it actually mean for you in terms of the impact that it has on kids' lives? Um, I, um, and it really being celebrated. What does that look like for you in like sort of kids' lives every day? I think it, I mean, in some ways it's as serious as life or death. In some ways it is really about confidence and building okay. self-awareness. When I say it's life and death, it's because I was one of those kids that disliked reading and just wasn't messing with reading at all because mm. I didn't see anything that spoke to me. There was nothing about a kid like myself at the library. And yeah. so oftentimes that gave me the message, not in, I don't think they meant to do that intentionally, but that gave me the message that like, these are not for you. I, I mm. led, I led or leaned more on hip hop and, and music and hip hop culture because of it spoke to me so much more, okay. not only audibly, but visually. Right. And so if if you don't know how to read, there's I mean, you could in a practical sense, you could eat something that has poison in it because you didn't read the the label. Right. But also in a more metaphorical sense, you could be consuming a whole lot of crap and not realize it. Or literacy is is so important to so many things, whether it's learning mathematics or financial literacy or how to, you know, have your record contract right so you don't get taken advantage of. Okay. Many of those those things are uh, go back to being able to develop a, not only a proficiency, but like a love for reading. And right. so I think in that sense, it's life and death. When it comes to like representation, I think kids in general, they have to see a reflection of themselves to know that they matter, to know that they they have a history mm. to know that they that there are other communities that are just like theirs and other ones that are different. And I think for so long, the the children's book world is is like a microcosm of Hollywood of, of so right. many mediums where it's all white, it's all male, and it's all uh, cisgender, it's heterosexual, and that's not the way the world that we live in. Right. And so right, okay. for for them to intentionally keep all these people out, it's. Um, it's criminal, it's negligent, it's um, it's disrespectful, it's so many things. Right. And so I think representation is not is not um it's not just a catchphrase, like it really does mean something to people. Right. And I think uh it's not about having a we are the world or a rainbow flag or like checking off a box. It's about investing in storytellers that are different from who you are, uh, for people who are in power, white folks specifically in power, and um not just as the illustrator or the author, but as the editor, as the agent, like there's an entire ecosystem that will take Most a story definitely. from concept to, to finish. So it is a, a very real thing. But then also, again, I truly believe it, it opens your mind. Like I explored so many different worlds just by reading, never even having gone to these places. I could go to those places in my mind and develop my mind from reading. So mm -hmm. that's definitely key in terms, I think, your our emotional health, our emotional intelligence, and being able to navigate worlds where we do have to interact with different people. Like you said, like the world isn't just cisgender, it's not just white, it's not just male. So I think we develop those things internally first as children, especially in our minds and who we are curious about, like you said, and yeah. I feel comfortable and confident to actually go there. You know what I mean? In a physical realm, once you've been there in your mind, you say, oh, maybe I'll go. I mean, kids do this naturally, go up and talk to someone. But because you've read a book maybe about France or you read a book about Senegal, you read a book about um the wild back country of Australia, if you meet somebody, you can strike up a conversation more easily and actually have that interaction in the real yep. world because you've read something, right? So I, yeah. I, I vibe with what you're saying and I totally wholeheartedly agree that it, it's so important. I mean, like you said, with me, Beach Street, when I saw that, I was done. But yeah. I was done. And yeah. like breaking, like what? Like, come on, man. Like, ugh. Just so many good memories around that. And me and my cousins trying to duplicate the breaking and yeah. my fat, fat lace is going down to Tiwa Uzi at East Mount Mall. Oh, Tiwa Uzi, yeah. You see what I'm saying? And just meeting new people and just tearing up my cousin's records trying to scratch. 
<laughs> my cousin's dad's records were Jack. We were trying to be in there scratching. So it's just that was an awesome, awesome thing as kids because we saw these movies with kids and you know people that look like us and like like you said, even just the aesthetic, right? The bright colors and the graffiti and our neighborhoods on screen. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if we don't have the diversity of stories being told, we're missing out, yeah. not just uh, on like a, a cool story, but like a whole other worldly experience. And like, if you're sure. hip to it, you read about it or you see it. Yeah, it does give you the confidence to be like, I know something about this, this yep. person and, and I can go talk to them or ask. I, they don't have to feel afraid. Yep. And I mean, 